Starship's second test flight has an unofficial now targeting date. Their new East Coast Tower receives an appendage. Starlink and Dragon are delivered off Earth. A new record is broken, and we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. After last Friday's episode dropped, SpaceX posted that the second flight test of their fully integrated Starship rocket could launch as soon as mid-November, pending regulatory approval, and thus confirming the rumors that I had just relayed. And in that post, they shared a link to their launch page on the SpaceX website that now has information regarding the second test flight available for you to look over. Quote, Starship's first flight test provides numerous lessons learned that directly contributed to several upgrades to both the vehicle and ground infrastructure to improve the probability of success on future flights. The second flight test will debut a hot staging separation system and a new electronic thrust vector control system for Super Heavy Raptor engines. In addition to reinforcements to the pad foundation and a water-cooled steel flame deflector, among many other enhancements. Of course, if you keep scrolling, there is the usual details for every SpaceX countdown, as well as a diagram of the flight plan in the test timeline. Cameron County posted road closures for early next week, but has since revoked the first two. So Wednesday is the day being targeted at this moment. The website says it's for non-flight testing, but this is likely for legal purposes. If the launch license is granted by the FAA, currently pending the U.S. Fish and Wildlife eval, then SpaceX will be go for a launch attempt on Wednesday, November 15th. Both notices to airmen and notices to mariners are in place, not just for the U.S., but for Mexico as well, and not just for the Gulf Coast, but for Hawaii too, where Starship is expected to perform a controlled splashdown. Generally, these dates span from the 13th to the 18th. And as the lead-up to liftoff presses on, a net that was installed under the orbital launch mount, presumably to protect the splash pad underneath it from any falling tools or debris, has since been removed. And on Thursday morning this week, SpaceX paraded around a handful of dudes who picked the shortest straws to hike the flight termination explosives to Starship. Double not them shoelaces, fellas. The explosives were immediately installed onto the vehicle, and then Starship was stacked on top of its booster that night. Maybe for its final time, but nobody really knows anymore. SpaceX may have a new way of arming the FTS without pulling her apart. Again, SpaceX doesn't even have their license yet, so either they are expecting it any time now, or they are galvanizing the public enthusiasm they have behind them to put more pressure on the government. Whenever SpaceX does light the world's largest firework, I will stream it live, so if you'd like to be my viewing buddy, subscribe to the channel. Buddy! 2023 was the planned year for Dear Moon to take Starship's first passengers to lunar orbit, but the guy behind it, MZ, wrote that it seems it will take a little longer. He's not sure when the flight will be, but will give us all an update when they know more. See you in 2028, sir. On Friday evening, Falcon 9 lifted off from Slick 40, Florida, carrying 23 more Starlink satellites. It was the record-breaking 18th mission for this first stage booster, landing successfully on the autonomous drone ship, a shortfall gravitas bobbing on the Atlantic Ocean. SpaceX posted that they secured a fairing half from this mission that supported 13 missions to date, and that the new crew tower at Slick 40 has received its crew access arm. This second tower was built because SpaceX is building another Starship mech tower near Pad 39A, and NASA wanted a backup just in case the primary was damaged by Starship. Early Wednesday morning, Falcon launched again from the same pad with the same number of Starlink sats. This booster flew for its 11th time and landed on just reading instructions like defying the laws of physics has just become routine business. Then on Thursday evening, SpaceX launched Commercial Resupply Service Mission 29 from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Done with a twice-flown Dragon capsule and booster, if you include this flight for each, the former will rendezvous and dock with the space station on Saturday morning. However, the latter docked with Earth back at the coast upon LZ-1 just minutes later. SpaceX is targeting Saturday morning for liftoff of their Transporter 9 mission, carrying 90 payloads, including CubeSats, Microsats, and orbital transfer vehicles carrying spacecraft of their own to be deployed at a later time. And the Department of the Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office, in partnership with the Space Force, has scheduled a Falcon Heavy mission for December 7th to take their X-37B test vehicle to Earth orbit, where it will perform a number of experiments for Uncle Sam. But now it's time for today's honorable mentions. Last week, Virgin Galactic launched its fifth commercial spaceflight with their suborbital spacecraft, the VSS Unity. Well, during an earnings call this week, the company's chief executive said they will be retiring the vehicle mid-next year, as they focus on developing their next-generation Delta Aero spacecraft. 
This information came just a day after Virgin Galactic announced a layoff of 18% of their workforce, as well as the reduction of other expenditures. The chief executive said Unity's purpose was to demonstrate their system, display their astronaut experience to the public, and provide data for their Delta program. The Delta class vehicle will enable six customers to fly at once, as opposed to four, fly twice a week versus monthly, and produce 12 times the revenue. And our other honorable mention goes to Frank Borman, another astronaut legend who passed away from a stroke this week at the age of 95, and thus passing the holder of oldest living astronaut to his friend and former crewmate Jim Lovell. Frank commanded his first mission, Gemini 7, and spent a record-breaking 14 days in orbit with Jim. Then he commanded Apollo 8 and became one of the first three humans to orbit the moon. Again, Jim was on his crew as well as Bill Anders. All three are Christians and so they read from the book of Genesis during a televised broadcast. Frank and Jim being the Protestants, Frank later joked that what was truly historic was getting that good Catholic Bill Anders to read from the King James Version of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Godspeed, Frank. Well, that's all for today, but it was good seeing you. Shout out to those supporting the production of these videos with their hard-earned and inflated coins. A nominal weekend to them. And until next time, Godspeed to you all.